Good afternoon, everybody. I'm going to talk to you today uh, about the Lincolnshire Energy from Waste Project, and in particular its development phase. Uh, with me is Matthew Collins uh, from Gifford. Matthew is responsible for the waste infrastructure market with Gifford. And I'm Director and Head of Waste to Energy at Ramble UK. Today in the UK, um, our local authorities have a major challenge. They have to look at diverting waste from landfill. Delivery of new infrastructure to divert waste from landfill is quite a significant challenge both in terms of the technology required, the planning, obtaining funding, and then organizing the contracts. And for Lincolnshire, they adopted an alternative approach to PFI. You're probably quite familiar with PFI, private finance initiative for a lot of hospitals, schools, and such like. Lincolnshire County Council, like most county councils, is a waste disposal authority. It has responsibilities to dispose of all the waste household waste and other waste that it collects in its area. It has a high recycling rate, around 50% or more. But that leaves something in the region of 150,000 tonnes a year of residual waste to dispose of. Lincolnshire is a large rural area. It's the fourth largest county in the UK. And like all counties, it's under a lot of cost pressure at the moment. So it needs a cost-effective long-term solution to move away from landfill to a suitable treatment system. Lincolnshire set up a procurement team and recruited Ramble, Gifford and FT to provide the technical advice in its procurement. Ramble has many years of building energy from waste facilities in, the, in uh, Scandinavia and has brought this expertise to the UK and helping Lincolnshire in terms of the design engineering, the procurement, and the implementation of the waste to energy facility. Gifford brought in expertise in civil engineering and waste infrastructure. FT for Healy Timoney brought in their expertise in waste management systems and in particular environmental management. So what are the project risks that we have to deal with? Particularly finance at the moment, everyone's fully aware of the issues there. Do they go for private finance through banks or do they use f public funds? The waste supply, in order to uh, run such a project you have to guarantee a supply of waste to feed the plant that acts as a fuel. The Waste Disposal Authority has a lot of potential fuel to deal with and it can make up any small shortfall with its own third party waste, perhaps that's an option. The technology. Should the procurement be completely neutral and leave it open to the market to decide what approach, or should it be selected by the authority and its advisors? Planning permission. That's a really, really big challenge today for building, especially waste infrastructure. There's a lot of nimbyism, banana, build absolutely nothing anywhere near anyone. Um, but. Um, it's a real challenge and it can take years and you, you end up with appeals and challenges and such like. So should it be the contractor that's left to do that or should it be the authority? What about the site? Where to put it? Do you leave it for the contractor to find a site? There's probably a limited number of sites in the area. Will there be a bit of a bun fight over bidders for the contract to find the best site? So why not let the authority procure the site and supply that to the bidders to use? So the choices were made. <clears throat> Principally, the authority decided it could de-risk this project to some extent and then encourage good quality bids. So the first move was to look at the technology and select the technology that would suit its purpose. And it chose, with our advice, moving great technology, which is well proven. We set out bespoke performance specifications clear method statements for bidders to put forward and we required robust guarantees and testing before the facility would be accepted by the authority. In terms of planning, the council secured planning permission. It went through the whole process of developing the design around the project and submitting the planning. Finance, it decided to go down the route of financing itself using prudential borrowing where necessary. 
and to pay for the construction through a milestone system. And then it would just be uh, left with providing or paying the contractor operating the plant operating fees without the normal PFI approach of operating fees plus debt servicing costs. The form of contract was a DBO, a design, build and operate contract based on SOPC4, which is the PFI form of contract backed by performance bonds and company guarantees. And that form of contract de-risks the, the works and the services from the council's perspective. Now the process itself, if I walk you through from left to right, waste is delivered in a bunker here by refuse truck or bulk vehicle. It's mixed by a crane to make it a homogeneous mix and then loaded into a feed chute here. It descends the chute and is indexed onto a grate, which is a, a sliding action grate. The waste is combusted on the grate, and just to give you an idea, the calorific value of waste is something in the order of a third of that of coal, so it will self-ignite, it doesn't need auxiliary fuel. The hot gas is passed through the boiler, and the heat is recovered in the radiant sections of the boiler, into the evaporator and superheater sections through here, and collected as steam in a steam drum at the top of the boiler. The steam then passes to a turbine, the turbine is used to drive a generator, which allows electricity to be exported from the site. The turbine also has a bleed for providing heat, district heating, which can also go to local buildings and industry. As the gases pass through the boiler, uh, the combustion of municipal waste generates an acidic gas with a number of pollutants. So it passes into a flue gas treatment system here where the gases are neutralized and the residues are collected, the air pollution control residues are collected in silo here and taken off for recycling or disposal. There are also burnt out ash, the bottom ash here is collected and that can be used as a secondary aggregate. <coughs> to give you some indication of uh, the layout, Ramball and its partners developed uh, the design for the facility and laid out uh, the plant in such a way that most technologies could fit in there of the given size. We worked with Studio E Architects to do the design. And this diagram is actually the other way around to the other one. So you've got a tipping hall at this end, feeding through a boiler here, flue gas treatment system here, and, a, and the exhaust gas exiting a chimney here. This is an air-cooled condenser, so that steam, after it's passed through the turbine, is condensed back and, and flows back through to the boiler. So looking a little bit more at the technology, this, is, this particular plant has a reverse-acting grate, so the waste is indexed down, and as the grate uh, operates, it, the, the grate bars work in a backward direction here, rotating the waste to ensure complete combustion. And to give you an idea of the efficiency, the combustion efficiency is around, typically around 99%. You get less than 1% unburnt carbon in the bottom ash here. And anybody who has a, a wood-burning stove or whatever like that at, at home, wood-burning fire, will know that you, if you open the grate at the bottom, that's how you, you make the fire burn. And here we have primary air which feeds the bottom of the grate. But we also have secondary air injection which controls the combustion and the, the generation of heat. During the combustion, the hot gases pass up through here, and the regulations say that we have to achieve 850 degrees C here for two seconds. The flue gas treatment system <coughs> comprises of exhaust gas running through a duct. Up in the duct, we introduce lime to neutralize the acid gas, and activated carbon which acts as an adsorbent to capture heavy metals. The dust is then collected in the baghouse filter and feeds through to ash silos, and the clean gas then provides, it goes through an ID fan and out of the stack. The recirculation silo there is to ensure that we don't simply throw spent lime away, we can reuse it again and dose a small percentage of additional material here. 
That's another picture showing some images of the flue gas treatment system. In terms of energy generation, we're looking at a, a steam turbine which is fed with uh, steam at 60 bar and around 425 degrees centigrade. And that generates a net output of 11 megawatts electric from 150,000 tons of waste. Around 2 megawatts is used to run the plant itself. So it's self-propelled and a net exporter of energy. There is also controlled extraction for district heating to local industry. Now I'll pass over to Matthew, we'll talk about the other aspects of the project. Great, thank you very much, Andrew. Typ typically, um, for major waste projects in the, in the UK, planning is left to the bidders and the contractors to secure. Um, and, and the thinking behind this is that it provides them with the maximum flexibility um, to develop their solutions and avoids the need for the authority to develop a design in the kind of detail that we did here. Um, and also therefore maximizes the risk transfer to the, to the private sector. Um, whilst these are indeed legitimate considerations, it does have significant disadvantages. Um, in particular, as you're sure you appreciate, as Andrew said already, securing planning for these sort of facilities is extremely difficult. And one of the key components is that is, is, is effective consultation with the public and other stakeholders. Um, and trying to do that in the constraints of a procurement process, um, which are both obviously short time scale and you may have competitive bids running, is very difficult. Um, and there are significant advantages in, in doing it in, in, outside that process. Um, also, of course, it's perceived to be a private sector project. Um, and again, the public opposition to that can be greater than if it's led by the public sector. Um, and all of this adds up to uncertainty in the market, um, and, and it's an international marketplace, and, and bidders are quite wary of how much they'll invest in the process and what prices they'll give when they know that even if they secure a project, get to a point of a preferred bid or even an awarded contract, it could be many years before the project's actually built, or it could die a death along the way. Um, so. In terms of, of, of Lincolnshire, um, as Andrew's already explained, they elected to actually secure full planning um, or, or submit a full up planning application before the procurement was commenced with a view to actually securing a full plan commission well before the end of the procurement process so the bidders could finalise their bids on the basis of, of a surety of knowing exactly what planning had been secured. Um, as part of the preparation for this process, it was included that it would be necessary to secure a full or submit and secure full planning consent rather than outline planning consent. Um, obviously, outline would have, in one sense, been easier. It might have been seen as a halfway station. Um, but the difficulty was, if we did that, there was a risk that when you came back to secure full planning, you'd open the whole planning process up again, and you'd, 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 all the risk you're trying to mitigate may well come back to bite you at that stage. Um, so we had to develop a full planning application. Um, the early selection of the technology, as Andrew stated, was a key component in this. By fixing on the technology, we were then able to start developing the building envelope to accommodate that. Um, and also, Lincolnshire were then able to sell the project as a public sector project to serve the people of Lincolnshire. But more importantly, they were able to then manage the, the public engagement process, which they managed over a long period of years. In the early stages, just building the case as to why this kind of treatment was necessary, why there was a need to move away from landfill addressing people's concerns along the way and dealing with the political um, pressures within the county so that by the time the planning application was actually submitted a lot of the a lot, a lot of the issues had been dealt with um, so how did we go about actually developing the the actual scheme designs to support, support the planning application this was a superb example of where ramble was able to draw on its scandinavian experience where a lot of plants are designed in, in far greater detail as part of the procurement process, which is not the case in the UK. And as part of that, we were able to develop a configuration for the facility that we were confident any of the major suppliers would be able to, or any supplier would be able to design their equipment to fit. Um, following confirmation of a basic configuration that, that was required in terms of proportions and configuration, we then worked closely with Studio E Architects and the Council to develop a a, a detailed scheme design 
Um, and that led into, into the preparation of the overall planning application, um, which was a highly collaborative affair because Lincolnshire used various consultants they had in their supply chain. So Jacobs did the EIA, Mouchelles did the planning, and I say we did the scheme design with Studio as the architect. But that all worked extremely well, um, and we were able to prepare a, a planning application in the, in the available time scale. Um, one, of the, one of the concerns or criticisms when we started this process is that it was that, that, that might be necessary to, to make the building significantly oversized to accommodate any potential solution. Um, but this wasn't actually the case. Most of these technologies having fixed on moving great technology are fairly similar and only a very modest degree of oversizing was necessary and that's actually borne benefits in terms of a, a future operation of the plant and maintenance. So there's not a great premium that's been paid there. So the next couple of slides just illustrate the, uh, the, the, the scheme design that was developed. This is a, obviously a plan on the site. Um, it's about three hectares. It's quite a constrained site for a, a facility of this size, but it was quite a nice um, uh, shape, as you can see there. It enabled us to, to adopt a, a linear um, process for the plant, as Andrew already explained, which is quite an efficient layout. Um, and again, drawing on Ramble and FT and Gifford's experience and studio, we were able to develop not just the, the design of the plant, but the overall layout of the site in terms of movements on the site and accommodating vehicles coming in and out um, and, 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 and all, the, all the other things that go with a site of this type. Um, and then this is the elevation on the building. Again, very substantial buildings. Um, the, the overall height of the building is about 46 metres and then the chimney is about 75 metres. So quite a significant... Um, 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 building in the, certainly in the Lincolnshire landscape, which I'm sure many of you are aware is quite is quite flat. Um, turning now to, 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 to procurement, um, whilst it's clearly necessary to follow the regulations, there are a number of options in the way the procurement could be could be approached. Competitive dialogue, rather than the restrictive procedure, is generally used um, for procurement of, of major infrastructure, and this allows the bidders the opportunity to explore variations in the technical and commercial and legal aspects of their deal um, with the authority where they feel they can offer better value for money. And notwithstanding that here that we had sort of prescribed the building as a starting point, that we still felt there were significant benefits in that. And indeed there were through the procurement process, lots of issues around the desi detailed design of the plant, the commercialities of the deal, the way the waste risks were handled in the contract were all, were all dealt with through the, through the competitive dialogue process. So it was still a very valid part of the process. Um, the, 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 the SOPC4 contract format was designed for PFI, but it has a big advantage in being well understood by the industry, and it was adopted as the basis for the contract in this case. Um, there are two fundamental types of, of sort of contract were available. One was to go for a design, build, finance, and operate contract. That could have either been with PFI or without PFI funding. Um, in which case it's more of a sort of PPP kind of project, but the, the principles would be very similar, although the authority wouldn't get the benefit of PFI credits. Or alternatively, they could go for a design, build, and operate contract um, under which the authority would actually fund the construction cost of the project. Um, in other respects, the contract could be the same as a, a, or very similar to a, 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 a PFI type of contract with design and build, and say, a 25-year operational period, all as part of the... The, the, the single contract, so that the contractor building it has the incentive to make sure he builds it well because he's got to operate it and live with the operational costs, um, so that all that risk is wrapped up in one, in one contract. But clearly the, the construction cost is paid up front. Um, and, and in many cases that, that, that capital cost can be partly supported by a, a loan from the Public Works Loans Board, which I saw was mentioned in another guys in an earlier presentation dating back to the 1800s, I think, so that's clearly a principle that's been around a long time. Um, um, so I think as, as that was, has already been clear from the early parts of this presentation, Lincolnshire decided sorry, to um, uh, adopt a DBO contract and to fund the capital cost of the project up front themselves. The contract, as I said, was based on the SOPC4 um, with very similar principles in relation to the actual transfer of risk for design, construction and operation. That, all of that was, 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 the drafting of that was very little change from what is in the standard contract. Um, however, they felt they were best positioned to deal with some of the significant risks, um, de-risk the project and get better value for money. And in particular, that included sourcing, providing the site, selecting the treatment technology um, and being prescriptive about that in the contract and securing the planning permission, as we've, I've just outlined. Um, 
And all of this avoided then the need for the, the bidder then to secure their own capital um, or, or go to the banks for capital to build the project. Um, and this was all with the intention of maximizing the attractiveness of the project into the market um, and providing a sound basis for securing good value for money um, in terms of the overall solution. Um, so did, 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 this, um, did this approach succeed? Um, I think in the case of Lincolnshire, and perhaps there's an element of luck, but I'm sure a lot of it was the hard work that was put in by everyone who was involved. Um, I think the facts speak for themselves. Um, this was the program that um, we, we fi finally achieved. Um, waste, although some early work had been done, the actual waste management strategy wasn't actually confirmed until some of 2008. Um, the planning application was been developed in parallel with that, but was submitted hot on its heels in the autumn of 2008, and the actual OGU notice for the procurement was submitted in November at, at the end of the year. Um, the preferred bidder was, uh, was appointed um, almost exactly two years later in October 2010, um, and that was WRG who were actually confirmed as the, or conf appointed as a contractor in March 2011. Um, the particularly significant point here is that um, they actually were able to mobilize and start construction in April 2011, um, um, and the service commencement date is planned for December 2013. So it was two and a half years from the time the OGU was issued to start a construction on site. Now, for many projects, that may seem a long time, and maybe in other parts of Europe it's still a long time, but in the UK, that is really quite a remarkable achievement for a major waste project. There's an awful lot of big projects like this that are actually marred down, in, in, particularly in planning processes, years after either the contract's been awarded or a preferred bidder has been appointed. Um, and to achieve a program like this is, is very significant. Um, so, Another important consideration, how well was the actual approach received by the market? Um, in particular, was the decision that was made to secure planning and in some respects constrain the bidders, was that seen as an advantage or a disadvantage um, by the bidding teams? Um, I think almost universally the feedback we got from the teams um, was very positive. We'll perhaps say that would, we wouldn't it, but I think that generally it was. Um, but more importantly is what actually where it ended up. Um, all the bidding teams actually elected to adopt the planning envelope that had been provided. Um, clearly some of them did experiment and there were minor variations put forward, but they were all ones that could be handled quite simply under the planning process under very minor variation procedures. Um, um, but most importantly, it ended up with producing very strong competition. It was quite clear that the bidders saw this as a project that could be delivered, that when they got the contract there would be something to build. And that not only, <laughs> that not only spurred them on, but it spurred their supply chain on. And I think Lincolnshire got a very, very good price. Um, and that we've had feedback, I think, from parts of the market saying that set a benchmark um, in the market for what can be achieved. Um, and as I've said, very notable um, start of construction. And that's a slide taken this summer. I say the, the contract was only awarded in March. The bunker well under construction this summer. So the final slide. Um, in conclusion, um, I think whilst delivering major infrastructure, waste infrastructure in the UK is very difficult and challenging, um, the approach adopted by Lincolnshire with Rambo's support has been very successful. Um, in particular, adopting a very intelligent approach to, to risk allocation um, and with the local authority being prepared with the support of their advisors to take on certain risks um, has actually enabled you know, a, a very efficient procurement process um, and hopefully one that's going to, well, well hopefully it's, it's one is on track to deliver a plant in a very, very significant um, tight timescale and at a very good price. Um, so thank you.